Jason Gardner, and I was your editor on Parenting with Presence, which and it was a wonderful experience as a parent working on this book with you. Um, so in in your book, Parenting with Presence, you say that you're living with your best teacher, and uh, I think people might be confused and think, well, aren't parents supposed to be the teachers for their children? Mm -hmm. So what what do you mean by that? Yeah. Well, we are. I think that comes with the territory that we are our teachers, you know, our children's teachers. But what I mean is that no one will push your buttons like your kids. No yeah. one. They seem to know exactly and precisely how to find the spot where you're vulnerable, where you're going to lose your cool, you're going to say and do those things you swore up and down you would never say and do. And the next thing you know, you're saying and doing them. Um, I know that was true for me as a parent, too. I had meditated most of my life, and I considered myself a fairly peaceful person. <laughs> and then yeah. stuff shows up that your children bring forth from you that um, that's confronting, and we can go down into a place of shame and of remorse. And on the other hand, if we choose to use those experiences to grow, they can be you know, unmatched in their possibilities for helping us become more of who we really want to be. That's wonderful. I certainly can relate to <laughs> be, being triggered. There's no question. Um, so this is, uh, Parenting with Presence is one of the first two books in Eckhart Tolle's uh, imprint, Eckhart Tolle Editions with New World Library. And so he wrote the forward and he gave you quite a bit of editorial yes. feedback. So what was it like working with him? It was a gift, honestly. It was an unexpected gift. Not only did they choose to take this book on, which in and of itself was just, you know, incredible. Um, I'm a huge fan of Eckhart's work and I um, think he, he's, you know, there are very few people that really walk the talk um, and he's one of them. But then he offered to go further and to help edit the book and he's, on the, first of all, he's a meticulous editor. He caught things very much about wanting to make sure that the reader understood an idea, that the reader wasn't left confused. He added ideas that would make it easier to follow and um, so that was just a, a real blessing for me as well, um, and fun. You know, he's really just a dream, you know, s such a a presence to be around and work with, and so um, very, very sweet gift. That's wonderful. Um, so uh, you 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 talk a lot about the difficulties that parents face with uh, digital devices and their kids' to their desire to use them as much as possible. So I, I know this is something that just about every parent I know yeah. grapples with this. Um, what advice do you give parents about this topic? You know, it's really uncharted territory yeah. for all of us. I, I, I don't think any parent, I sometimes compare it to a house on fire or a runaway train. I don't think any of us were prepared for what it would mean. And um, and yet and it still grows, you know. Then there are new apps, and, and you know, how do you even keep up with something that lets your kids send a message to each other that disintegrates after a few seconds? <laughs> yeah. So um, it really you have to go underneath. It can't be about control. Although I do strongly uh, urge parents to set guidelines and standards and to be fearless in doing that. You have to, as a parent, you really, I talk about being the captain of the ship a lot. Yeah. And in this regard, you have to be willing for your kids to really not like you or to not think it's fair. Um, but you also have to kind of, I, well, have to, I suggest that um, a few things. One, that we look at our own use. Um, that's if, hard. <laughs> if you look at parents strolling their children or nursing their children and texting or sitting at the park, the level of boredom that we've become um, averse to, like how quickly it becomes tedious to do the mundane things of parenting, which it does, I understand. But those are also opportunities, at least some of the time, to just be present. Wow, I'm just sitting here on a bench watching my child swing, and do I need to model for them, this is what you do in a, in a down moment? Or can I inhabit a place that says, well, it's okay to just enjoy this moment. And, um, and then also, as I said, um, being apprised, like being up to date with what your kids are doing and setting really tight guidelines. I strongly urge parents not to have computers in their children's bedrooms. I know there's iPads and there's phones and there's all these devices. But at the very least, with younger kids and homework, it should be in a common area. Um, and, and to really, you know, look at the underlying issue inside ourselves, which is, I'm afraid that my kids will hate me 
if I try and set a limit that their friends don't have. And so a lot of that is going deeper where can I live with the fact that my kids for this period of time don't like me, you know. Um, I never had video games, for instance. That was more the thing. My son's 24, so that was more what everybody had. It wasn't, we were teetering on the edge of the internet stuff. Yeah. And um, we just didn't have them. And so I had to help him sometimes be sad about it, be willing to experience that. And um, mm -hmm. and now he says, oh, I'll, I would never have them for my own kids. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's that's interesting. Um, well, you, you mentioned uh, being captain of the ship, which I think is something that I think Certainly, with my generation of parents, there's a, a, a hes, you know hesitance mm -hmm. with that and mm -hmm. a little problem with that. Um, you know, I th I think people view that as maybe being authoritarian right. or you know that you're being controlling. How how do you right. balance Good. those things? Yeah, it's not about control. So I really want to make mm -hmm. that clear. It's about being in charge, and it's different. Yeah. So the analogy I've used, I don't know where this came from, but it just landed in my head one day, and I've run with it, which is if you're on a, a ship. You want there to be a captain. You want there to be somebody who's the designated driver, mm -hmm. you know, who actually knows how to handle not only getting you from A to B, but what to do if there's a, a storm or the seas get really rough and rocky or there's a leak or something happens. You want that person. And, and so this represents you as the parent. This is the child, right? It's very comforting to a child to have this dependency that they can lean on you for guidance, but it's not about control. If you feel out of control as a parent, you're actually below the child down uh, here. I call okay. that the dictator. These are the lawyers where you're nobody's in charge. So it you know, it's not the leave it to beaver, you know, because I said so. I'm right. so not about that. Yeah, but I am yeah. about what is what might be getting in the way for you to inhabit fully that role that your kids actually need you to be in. Now, as they get older, it will be modified more. They mm -hmm. become the captain. You're sort of the advisor, yeah. but with young children, we know that they're actually quite relaxed. I see this in my therapy office all the time. The kids want to know that their parents can actually handle what they're going through, and they don't have to hide the truth from them when they're having a rough time. So that's part of it is is validating. I mean, you you yeah. talk a lot about validating emotions and feelings. Yes. So so there's this balance that you, as a parent you try to to give where you acknowledge the kids. Uh, feelings, their their emotions, and that, yes. that it's okay to experience that, right? I, it's more than okay. Yeah. If you think about it, I often say we're not raising children, we're raising adults. Mm -hmm. And that means if you can, in this moment, you might have a five-year-old, a three-year-old, a 12-year-old, but ultimately your job is to shepherd that person into decades of, hopefully decades of adult life. And you want them to have the resources within to draw upon, that they can be resilient, they can handle life's up and downs, they don't stalk their girlfriend if she breaks up with her, with them, you know, that. So how do you do that? You do that while they're under your roof and you have a chance when, when you know, little Thomas doesn't, can't have the, the last donut, you know, because uh, you're saving it for grandma and he's having a fit about it. Well, you have a, a few options. One is, okay, fine, have the donut. But the fact is, you had this opportunity in that moment to say, sweetheart, I really know. It was such a good donut. You love donuts. It doesn't seem fair. So you're letting him know, I'm so captain-y that I can handle the reality here, which is that we're in a little mini storm. Yeah. And then the same thing happens when your 14-year-old, you find out that they've been drinking a lot. You know, Then it's not about a donut. It's about something much bigger. But then they know that they can come to you with difficulty, and you can help them feel this the disappointment, the sadness that's been informing their their perhaps unhealthy choices. So, um, one, I mean, with a, a small child, I have a, a three-year-old, um, you know, emotions are, I know, you know, reading your book, you learn about the prefrontal cortex, which isn't, hasn't really formed yet in kids. Um, you know, with, with these wild emotions, do you have any specific advice for parents on how to, how to cope with all that and, and make it through your day? <laughs> Minute by minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think a big part of it, yeah, kids are just wild sometimes. And it depends on the child you get, too, you know. Some children, they come out fairly calm and serene, easygoing. And others, boy, I had a session with somebody just the other day, and I just said, boy, I really feel for you. Like, you got a wildfire. <laughs> you really did. This being landed in your life that's everything, the volume is up on everything. 
Yeah. So it's not just I'm sad. I, I'm tragically devastated. Right? I'm not just happy. I'm you know over the moon excited. And the advice is really to stay centered in yourself, to not take it personally, to as much as possible tune into yourself when you're triggered by that enormity of what they're expressing, um, and to slow things down. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we know about really dramatic kids or really intense kids is that when you, well, with anyone, when you come at them, when you come at anyone, sweetheart, why are you so upset? It's not that big a deal. Now you've just thrown gasoline onto the mat, onto the fire. Okay. So you want to come, I talk about coming alongside versus coming at. Coming alongside is something um, that I teach in my work. It's, I call it Act One, where you're preparing the child to be open to your advice. So they're really, you know, losing it and they're flailing about and I know you wanted that. It doesn't seem fair again. Um, mm -hmm. and, and staying in a place, or if you can't, look, if you fall apart, you fall apart. It's okay. It's really okay. You may well match them on the playground and become another three-year-old. Well, I'm not even going to give you dinner then if you don't like what I made, you know, and that's okay <laughs> right. too. Uh -huh. Yeah, one of the things you talk about in the book which I think parents can't hear too much is is about not being perfect and you know everybody, yes. you know again I think my generation kids who grew up in the 70s they have this this maybe this is every generation but this idea that you're going to do things differently and you're going to yeah. try to be the, the parent that you maybe <laughs> didn't feel like yeah. you, you had um, and so there's a lot of feeling of, of um, you know imperfection and, and kind of falling yeah. short of what yeah. you want to do I mean is there any advice that you give parents about that you know, this is where we pull the camera back and look at the whole thing of parenting as another inroad or opportunity for growth. Yes, you're raising the child, but for me, parenting is also a transformational path. Could he, some people even think of it as a, as a spiritual path. So in that moment when um, you're imperfect, which, God, I, I think I lived the majority of my parenting life, mm -hmm. certainly spent a lot of time there, to take that breath, to close your eyes, I actually have parents put their hand over their heart sometimes when they're really coming down on themselves or they've really fallen apart, and I have them do this, they're there, they're yeah. there. Just the way you would for your child, that you would, or a loving, a friend you love and care about. Uh -huh. And so, um, sure, those moments can help us know where we need to grow and maybe where we need help. A lot of times we don't avail ourselves of help, you know. My whole work as a, a therapist and a writer is about supporting parents. Everything that I'm doing in my work life is about how can I be a resource like this book? How can I provide support? Because we aren't meant to do this alone. We aren't meant to parent in isolation. And sometimes that alone will just drive us into such overwhelm and exhaustion that we fall apart regularly, and if that's what's going on, that's a sign or an indication, look, you gotta have some support here, some help, some advice, some something.